somewhere or other, hasn't it? It's got that's always going to feature. But how do we make our streets safer? The wider question. Oh eight hundred seven three one two thousand. Now you, you've heard of sports washing, haven't you? And you've heard of money laundering, haven't you? But have you ever heard of racism laundering? Does anybody know what that means? Give me a call. Oh eight hundred seven three one two thousand. I've given our guest a call, Nell Sabi, because you know what racism laundering is, don't you? Or at least, what is it according to you? Hello, Nels. Hello. Hello, Nels Abbey. Happy Black History Month. And happy Nigerian independence to you, Mr. Adebayo. It's good to be here. (laughs) I forgot something. Ah, That is embarrassing. Um, (laughs) Anyway, uh, yeah, what is racism laundering when it's at home? Yeah, so racism laundering is actually a phrase I... Um, it's a concept in which you leverage the, basically in raw terms, of the concept in which you leverage the skin color of an ethnic minority or, or perhaps some other identity characteristic of an ethnic minority um, to push through narratives or policies or procedures or politics um, that would otherwise be considered to be racist. So, for example, it is a lot easier to push through, say, a racist um, um, home affairs policy African state with a non-white home secretary that it would be, say, with a white home secretary in the year 2023. Yeah, I read this article when you wrote it, and uh, essentially, let's talk about the current situation. Let's not beat around the bush. It's easier, is it, for Suella Braverman to have a proper migrants than it would be for a white home secretary? Is that what you're suggesting? Without a shadow of a doubt, there, there's no doubt about it. I don't think this is. I don't think it's a coincidence that, barring a short blip with um, with Grant Chaps uh, during the the um, bonfire days of um, of Liz Truss, the latter bonfire days of Liz Truss, we've had nothing but white, uh, but um, ethnic minority home secretaries since the Windrush scandal. The Windrush scandal was the big bang of. Um, of racism laundering in British history. I'll give, and I must, and the reason why I say this is that before the Windrush scandal actually happened, we'd never actually had a ethnic minority occupant of one of the great offices of state. So Windrush, essentially, the lives that were pay the pain and the suffering of everybody else that was that happened for people of Caribbean descent or so, their pain, their suffering became the actual blessing predominantly for politicians of Asian descent to break into high office and now go an Asian um, prime minister, which has actually been so one person's pain has been another person's pleasure. But the problem with it too is that the pain is no longer is not receding. It's getting worse increasingly right and is now. It, is it easier for um if for Rishi Sudak to turn his back on reparations and say, look, yeah, let's not bother about that passing, than it would be for a white prime minister to? I think that rep- reparations is an interesting one because I don't think that... I think you, well, the answer is yes, um, but I don't think that reparations would be... I, I think the closest you'd probably ever come to, say, reparations in British history was the was the period where Jeremy Corbyn... was in the 2017 election when Jeremy Corbyn um, came as close to a to a very, very would have been the, the most pro-black prime minister we, we, we've ever had in British history and probably ever will have. Um, but so the idea of reparations as a as driven, as pushed through by a, an act of parliament, um, regardless of the ethnic colour of, of the prime minister, would be, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough push. But the problem that we actually have now is that um, with an Asian or black or brown prime minister or so, the idea of actually pushing back reparations or not apologising for anything else in the in the post Windrush post Black Lives Matter world, it's significantly easier for them to do and for them to ignore than say it would be for a white person to do so. So when Starmer gets in power and one of when, when say Bell Ribera or or one of the other Labour MPs gets up and actually asks Starmer to make an apology for slavery, it's going to be very very interesting to see what Starmer says. Yeah. So let's let's explore this history. Um, was it five years ago that Amber Rudd was yes. Home Secretary and she lost her job essentially over uh, the Windrush scandal, you know, the discovery. It came up at that point that people of Caribbean heritage uh, who had been here all their lives uh, were now being chased out of the country if they didn't have the uh, modern context of a, an attachment to this uh, United Kingdom uh, through a passport, essentially. Now, 
are you suggesting this racism laundering would have seen, at the time, five years ago, I'm talking about, would have seen a Home Secretary like Suella Braverman as she is today, or uh, like Priti Patel as she was uh, prior to Suella Braverman, do you think they would have survived that Windrush scandal? Because yeah, arguably, I think that... arguably Priti Patel didn't survive it, did it? It still was part of uh, what was holding back her tenure as Home Secretary, arguably. <laughs> I would say that Pretty Patel, or I, I, again, so it's what I think would happen, and what has actually happened are, are to almost reinforce each other, but differ slightly. I think that Pretty Patel, or Suella Bradman, or Sajid Javid before the before the two of them probably would have survived it. I think they probably would have survived it. And I think that the suffering of people as far as um, Windrush are concerned would have been a significantly higher and harder because of the fact that there would be such a degree of racism laundering that it would almost be able to spin it um, in a way in which there's nothing to see here. And those very people could still be in the quagmire as they still are, I must point out, the actual Windrush scandal is still going on. A lot of people haven't been compensated, and a lot of people are dying before they could be compensated. My our brother Patrick Vernon is doing some fantastic work on this. But there's something else that happened during Windrush, too. You must look at who they sent out to respond, to go into the press and respond to the Windrush scandal. And it was none other than Kwasi Kwarteng. Now, that is no coincidence. So I describe these whole things that we're seeing here uh, collectively. I this race and laundering, in my view, is an offer, is a, is a byproduct of Johnsonian diversity. Johnsonian diversity has been, a, it's just been almost like race and laundering on steroids. Or Johnsonian, on as in Borisonian. Boris Johnson, absolutely. Right, okay. Boris Johnson, when he became mayor of London in 2000, I believe it was 2000, Johnson um, was asked by Nihau, uh, Nihau on, I believe it was somewhere on the BBC. Five Live, uh, yeah, five Life. Yeah, yeah, Nihau, but, Nihau Nihau asked him about, about race and racism question. And Boris Johnson looked Nihau in the eye and said to him that, yeah, that um, you're not going to out-ethnic minority me. That I that I that basically that I'm more that I know this stuff this well I know it very very well I That's know what I'm doing here. That's the way he speaks, though, isn't it? You're not going to out. Well, he out. proved us right. Oh. He proved us right. That man knew race and racism very very well and has changed this country in a way that has been that's almost unrecognisable to a degree right now where we have a Asian, typically an Asian. Our home secretary is operating as a new Enoch Powell and saying things that Enoch Powell oh, would oh, never oh, gotten whoa, away with. Whoa, 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 really? No, that's not. Yeah, of course. Well, Enoch Powell. You're, you're, the, you're speech saying, that, you're, no, the speech that he's known for is Rivers of Blood. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But you take a look it's, at when, when Suella Braverman goes but, to. Um, but Suella Braverman has done multiple power like moves this in the last seven days. Yeah, but she's never suggested that the streets of Britain are going to be flowing like the rivers Tiber, did she? She, yeah. she, she, she not, hasn't suggested she, that there will be ethnic violence on our street and yeah, actually she did she really? did what yeah no. she did yeah no she no, did no. she said she did but not multiculturalism but... yeah she well, it wasn't ethnic she didn't say ethnic did she yeah but when you're talking about multicultural you're talking about ethnicity or so in britain dotton these are effectively synonyms these are used as interchangeable terms so it's not they're not thinking about hey the difference between i don't know the geordies going out half naked in the middle of the snow and the scout and, and, the, and the glaswegians eating fried mars bars no they're talking about people like me as you coming along looking different or so perhaps bringing different different cultures and everything else all together into the actual country so the actual link to multiculturalism and multi-ethnicism and, and multi-race multi-race is or so, or um, or multi-religious elements or so, is very very stark. It's very very clear. Now, yeah. when she says multiculturalism has actually failed, she has benefited from the actual work of as far as multiculturalism. Yeah, concerned. we know that. We know that. But now Please. she's sitting there as Home Secretary. It's a different dimension for her, isn't it? Uh, and and the role that she fills now isn't the role that she may have occupied when she was younger and was a beneficiary of multiculturalism. The role that she fills now is to make sure somehow that the people trying to get into this country through term, uh, methods that she would describe as illegal are stopped. That's her job. That's her job. And frankly, Kwasi Kwarteng, um, coming up representing all black people, um, used for political expedience, yeah, but people are. That is the politics, you know. Look, who would you rather, or which of the messages of around race are likely to get through would it be if Liz Truss fronted a response to Windrush or would it be if Kwasi Kwarteng 
it's the quasi quarting is the one that's going to filter not, and people not react to. No, but I Liz don't Truss, think so. In fact, really, Liz I Truss. I think talking that, about no, Windrush. I think that, I think that what has to happen is this: is that what has happened as far as race and laundry is concerned, and uh, at Johnson in diversity has brought a degree of extreme dishonesty into our politics. And I think that if you're going to stab me, or I'm not, I'm not going to use that type of term. If you're going to actually, um, if you're going to do something to me, I'd rather you just come out and actually do it and do it in your own face in your own name. Bringing somebody who looks like me along or so compounds the pain and disgrace could actually cause grace causes greater division that, within our community. Yeah. Let me give an example, Doctor. Let me give an example, okay. Doctor. And I'll give you one right? as well. Uh, please, please, for these. No, no, go ahead. Quasi, 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 myself and yourself, we're all of continental African descent. West Africa, go further. West Africa, yes. Which means that our forebears did not go through the horrors of the Middle Passage. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They did not go, they were not taken, they were not taken to the Caribbean or anything else, so yep. enslaved over there. When you take a, when you have a, when you're a historian who's discernibly Ghanaian, you've got a name like Kwasi Kwarteng, and then you are, can allow your name, your prototype, your race, your everything to be rolled out there as in, as a response factor to the pain and suffering of predominantly elderly black people who went, whose descendants, whose forebears went through the the horrors of the Middle Passage, whose forebears were enslaved. And you know the history that, look, for the longest time or so, our community has always had that wedge down the middle. And we are finally becoming one community where we recognize each other as black British people with our various descents, but we try and understand it a little bit more, where our Caribbean brothers and sisters are starting to recognize much, much more of themselves in their origin or so, in their origin stage, which is, comes from the West African coastline predominantly, and we recognize them as us, and we're really forming something beautiful. But you are not smart enough as a historian to know that this would be disastrous for the community I come from, for me well, to go out there and be the response again, to this. Again, I say that you almost have to separate um, Kwasi Kwarteng, the historian, from Kwasi Kwarteng, the politician. That aside... I can't though, do that. I refuse to do that. Because yeah, we, uh, mu- we must be uh, clear. Saying, what they used to say about the football is that which one do you place first, country or club? Well, you yeah. two have to be... You two, well, the politicians have to be clear about it too. Which one do you place first, community or party? Uh, but nobody, ever, it, nobody ever asked you to put your job up against another alternative and say, which do you choose? You, you, you choose your job in many cases, but some people told, Doctor, some I... people put the community ahead of their job. I, I'm not arguing against that. Yep. But I'm just saying that most people, you know, let's be fair now. Most people think, look, I, I do love my community, but this is my job. And the way I see doing my job is to tax the poor and let the rich uh, suffer, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. But what do we do in terms of racism laundering, which is a great term, to use in this respect. In terms of racism laundering, what do we do about the police force, which is trying to recruit more black officers? Is that not patronising? And do we not expect to see the black officer being up there and saying, look, this isn't about race, because look, there's a black officer here as well. We are just going to... Well, I won't quote... I won't quote... um, uh, what's his name uh, with that thing about this policeman keeps on beating me to death um, I, I won't quote um, Benjamin Zephaniah that was it yeah. but do you know you can imagine Benjamin Zephaniah saying it look this policeman keeps on beating me to death and he's a black policeman so it's not racist do you know what I mean yeah. so the, the, the issue with racism laundering is that you're going to have to deal with so many other aspects of look the black face is actually the pr- pragmatic face in this respect. Well, Dotton, if I were your, your viewer, your listeners probably don't know what I look like or don't know much about me, but if you go back to 2013... Let me just tell them all that the, you are a Scandinavian, an Aryan Scandinavian, <laughs> and you're seven foot tall and blue eyed. You, you forgot to mention handsome too at the same time. But I was yeah, going but to also go. mention your Chinese roots, but I didn't have time for all of that. <laughs> Absolutely. But anyway, but, but the key thing about it is that in 2013, in 2011, a man called Mark Duggan was killed by the police in this country. Um, suddenly the police actually, in, in, in Tottenham, suddenly the police force recruits a, makes a black man the head of the actual police uh, borough, the borough commander for Haringey. And then um, when they did the big, I, I didn't know the guy, I didn't know this, this, uh, this had been happened, but when they did the big announcement of the actual inquiry into Mark Duggan's death, suddenly there was a big press scrum outside the top of the police station. I, went, I was living in Stanford. At the time, I just would walk down there and I went to go and actually join the press scrum. I was obviously doing the bits of bobs with the Voice newspaper. 
at the time. And then there was a black police officer there. And I decided to ask him some questions. I decided I didn't have the language of racism and laundering at the time, but I suspected I recognised what was going on there. Because it's very expedient to put in a black borough commander in an area where you've had a very, very significant racial problem at that particular time. So it felt a little bit like this feels very convenient to me. And I asked him. Suddenly, I found myself in a BBC documentary called The Met. And they actually used me and my exchange with him for the trailer for The Met. And then they became pretty for the trailer for the first episode of The Met. So that very moment was a big moment there. But the key thing about it to me is this, right, is that when it boils down to it, in the words of Havoc of Mob Deep, worst come to worst, my people come first. That even if it's, um, if it's, even if it's the job or whatever it might be or so, I am not... I refuse to collaborate. And if you do collaborate or so, then that's fine. But don't expect us not to call you out for collaborating. Yeah, yeah. Don't think that you're going to be welcomed back to the well, community well, like, it's, you, every, you, like nothing you, you would say black police officers are collaborating. Uh, no, I'm not saying that. No, 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 I'm not saying that. It's why this bit. Actually, no, I'm not saying oh, that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that a black police officer is inherently collaborating. No, Leroy Logan has the exact same philosophy as me, and his career suffered as a result. Um, there are many, many black police officers who stand up and do the right thing. There's many. There's even people uh, in all areas or so. Even that there was a lady we just found out the other day about the. I think she was at the IPCC or whatever it's called now, the Police uh, Complaints Commissioner, com Police Complaints Police Complaints Commissioning Organization or so. That that lady's life, she decided to look into racism and the police force something just like that. And then suddenly the police decided to look into her and almost attempt to destroy her life. So there are people who turn around who try and work within the system, but the problem is that the system actually punishes them. Yeah, so I'm yeah, not yeah. saying, please, please, yeah. Go on, yeah. So I'm, I'm not saying that there's, um, there's, there's inherently, um, I would never impugn my brothers and sisters who are, or my aunts and uncles or my. Or, who go and join the actual police force. That's not the case in the slightest bit. Um, what I am saying is that if you go there and you become a, so a blind eye to police brutality, you become a blind eye to actual racism, you become a racism who launderer, a mule that? of racism, who, who, that's the problem. Who defines if you've turned a blind eye to all of these things that you've mentioned? Who defines that? Because, you know, sometimes people are working in a different way from you within the system, if you like. Do they then, because you've decided that as far as you can see that they're not standing up too black too strong that they are then collaborators as you put it who, well, who, no, it's who not, determines, it's not who, determines who is a collaborator and which officer isn't I think that everybody, it's not just one person who determines it, it's all of us who determine it as a community, that we, everybody knows, as the, as the old saying goes, all skin folk are not all kin folk are not skin folk and vice versa everybody, when you walk inside a room or so, after a bit of time, you develop a reputation. People know who they can turn to in a profession. People know who, when it comes to black people or so, we have to know our surroundings very, very quickly um, if you want to survive. Um, so you know who, you, who who's an ally, even amongst yourself. We have code terms for it. We know who is quote unquote down, and we know who is not. We know who's 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 riding, and we know who's riding against us. That's just eventually you, you buy their fruits. They are known. Um, it's not about who judges it. It's about the fruits that you display onto us, and then you take it forward from there. Okay, it's going to be a hard one to sell. This uh, I, I can see it already. It's going to be a difficult one to sell this racism laundering because you will have all the other aspects that people will argue with about that. Uh, let's move the conversation slightly differently just for a moment, Nels, um, to, 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 to wind up this conversation. You know, the last time I spoke to you, I think it was last time I spoke to you, if it wasn't a column that I was reading of yours and I felt that I'd spoken to you. So so visceral are your columns uh, nowadays. Uh, you said, watch this space with regards to that incident at the hair care products uh, shop in Peckham. And I yep. was expecting you to say that we've, fought, I mean, I genuinely was, I'm not just saying this. I generally expect you to come back and say, look, we have formed some kind of black think tank where we've decided to set up our own network of hair care products shops online or otherwise that will give black women an alternative from being uh, mistreated, if that is the case, in a shop like that one. I'm not impugning any other shops, but that one specifically where they had, you know, somewhat overzealous security guard, I think uh, a lot of people regarded it as. Uh, any any movement on that? What so I'll say saying? this to you. What's so the first, thing, the first thing I'll say this is that it's unacceptable that a black woman goes inside a shop, no matter what the circumstances are, and we are then seeing footage of her getting strangled inside the shop. It doesn't that... So as, as, Restrained, as, very vociferously. Yeah. 
we we can't we can't we cannot not see that. But we also know. That, but the bigger abomination of this is the fact that look that um, we basically the black hair hair and skin um, retail market is worth at least hundreds of millions, possibly billions or so. And that's a that's a leakage from our community. It's money that's just flowing out of our community. That cannot be allowed to continue in perpetuity. It's actually, it's an economic and a social and political abomination onto our community too. So what do we it's do? Business. It's business. What do we do? So, it's really, so the, the reality of it is that, it's so what it presents here is that from the ashes, from the, from the pain that our sister suffered there, there is an opportunity here because in these sorts of moments, it's like it's like the concrete wetting itself again, or and you have to find you have to find a way to mold the concrete to where you want it to be. So for me, I'm taking some time out speaking to people who are who I'm trying to persuade, who are trying to use the power of persuasion, and speaking to a group of people um, who are of means and um, who have some degree of um, ability, and um, and are people who to use the old word again who are down. Um, to see what we could potentially do and to see what we could potentially do as far as the broader community is concerned too. Because again, if there's something that I think that we can do well in our community, it's exemplary, it's exemplary with forms of business with that. If the African way, it's not the African way in which the winner takes all and one person pretty much is making the majority of the money or so. We try and do things in which we can actually make sure as many people are winning together as possible. And I think that's, there's some things, a couple of ideas I'm working on right now. Um, I'm trying to get okay. some, okay. some bits of books together and we'll take from there, we'll, keep, we'll keep watching this space. Meanwhile, you you've quoted Mob Deep to me, so I've got yeah. I've got quotes from Bob Marley back at you. It shows a generation <laughs> gap, yeah, generation <laughs> gap. I'll never forget no way they crucified Jesus Christ. I'll never forget no way they sold Marcus Garvey for rice. I'll never forget no way they turned their backs on poor Bogu. So don't you forget no way who you are and where you stand in the struggle. Nels. That was amazing, but I would say don't quit the day job just yet. Uh, give, it, give yourself give yourself some <laughs> skill, but you, you're a work in practice. Um, you're getting there. You're a work in progress there, I'd say, but yeah. you'll get there eventually. I've only been married to her for 21 years. 22, yeah. 22. <laughs> Queen of Lovers Rock. Nels Abbey, thank you very much. Nels Abbey, writer and journalist there. Oh, well, oh, quoting Mob Deep, I suppose.